Hi, all. Welcome. Good to see you, Diana. Great to have you with us, Beverly. Karen, great to see you. Terrence, glad you could join us. Um, Heather, good to see you too. Take a moment and go ahead and drop into the chat um, where you are tuning in from. Let us know. Let us know, Chris. Chris from Chris from USA and Dee Blunt. Let us know where you're tuning in from, who you're with. Um, glad to have you with us here on the Stewardship Network's monthly webcast. We'll get this kicked off here in just a sec, but in the meantime, we're going to let everybody into the room and take a moment to get settled and comfortable. But like I said, go ahead and drop into the chat. Um, Heather, great to see you from Fayette County Conservation District. Lots of love to all the Conservation District folks. Great to have you with us. Glad you could be joining us. Heather, glad you're in Southwest PA. I was just telling Tom when we were beforehand, I just love the Pennsylvania Forest, right? Just so special to me. Great to have you from the Metro Parks and U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Toledo. Karen, great to have you with us. Great. Well, I want to welcome you all to the Stewardship Network's monthly webcast. Really pleased to be back here with you um, today. I'm Lisa Brush. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Stewardship Network, I want to just kick it off with a little intro about us. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. We've got a 20-year national and international award-winning history. We serve 20-plus place-based member communities, geographically place-based member communities made up of all of the people and organizations that care for land and water in a given community who get together to learn from each other and do collaborative stewardship. Currently from the Great Lakes to the Pacific Ocean, soon we'll be able to say from the Atlantic to the Pacific, but stay tuned for that, that's a little teaser. These free monthly webcasts happen each and every month on the second Wednesday during the Eastern Time Zone's noon hour. So what I encourage you to do, we've been doing these since 15 years at least, um, so I encourage you to put a little put a little repeating um, event in your calendar and then go check out our website to see if you want to tune in that month. We've got folks who tune in every month regularly. We've got new ones. We've got episodic attendees. So really encourage you all to put that event in your calendar and check it out. Our mission is to connect, equip, and mobilize people and organizations to care for land and water in their communities. So in that connection, we take the specialized knowledge that we learn from all of you and disseminate it as widely as possible, just like we are doing here today on the webcast. We just finished our annual conference a little bit over a month ago. Um, we equip, we move, we move the hurdles to our, for our member communities and you all to keep you out to pour thousands of hours into your ecosystems. And as we say, we wanna keep you out in the field, not in the office doing the stuff that we can help take care of for you. So we wanna keep you out in the field doing as much great work as you can. We mobilize through our member communities, making ecological uh, stewardship accessible to all. We want to really get everybody as that we can out in the community doing the great work that you all do um, to steward your land and water. So really, our biggest piece of that is our spring challenge, which will kick off next month during next month's webcast, and it runs through the end of June. Sometimes the work of stewardship can feel a little overwhelming and daunting and like you're alone in this. And so the Spring Challenge is really meant to celebrate and highlight the work that we do together and encourage you all to do more together. We um, last year had over 50,000 hours and more than 13,000 participants who reported everything from prescribed fire to invasive species control to monitoring, whether that's macro invertebrates or photo monitoring, education, all kinds of things. So you'll learn a little bit more about that next month. So we will be um, bringing back we're continuing to make reporting easier and easier and easier for you. Um, but we'll bring back all the good stuff, like the prize pantry. We've got some really great things that are coming into the prize pantry. I just had an email from somebody this morning that I was um, that I was talking to about a super cool technological piece of, that we'll put in the prize pantry, and we do a weekly drawing. So I encourage you all to check that out. And join us next month during the webcast for our kickoff. And with that... I would like to introduce you to Tom Keller. Tom, thanks so much for joining us from the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Tom is going to be talking about returning the wild to the wilderness, lost legacy and new opportunity. So I'm looking forward to being with you during the next hour. Go ahead and drop any questions that you have in the chat. I'll be monitoring that. Feel free to questions and clarifications. It's a great community here. And people are often sharing um, information and ideas in the chat answering questions that are coming up. So I encourage you all to make wide use of the chat. Bobby, good to see you from Grand Haven. John, great to have you from the Little Traverse Bay Band. 
wonderful to have you all here, but go ahead and make wide use of the chat and we'll just turn it over to Tom here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. So as Lisa mentioned, I'm with the Pennsylvania Game Commission and I'm the fur bear biologist. And so I have 16 species in the state that we try to help manage for. But today we're going to be talking about one that's not on that list, um, but that used to be here in the state. But before we do that, we need to first understand what happened, what happened to the American Martin in Pennsylvania and and how did we lose it? Why are we even at this point of considering reintroduction? So the first thing we're going to do is actually step back in time and we're going to look at Pennsylvania, what things would have looked like. And this may be a very similar story to many of the states that you are from uh, based on the comments in the chat. And so the first thing we need to consider is Pennsylvania was really mostly forested. And so we had this very diverse coniferous deciduous mix within the state. And early explorers would have come up the Susquehanna River, the Delaware River. And what they described was these massive forests with humongous trees and teeming with wildlife. And they described it as an inexhaustible resource. And so that's something that we need to remember because we know that that's not really true. And what we see in Pennsylvania, specifically with our settlement pattern here within the state, is that settlement started as early as the late 1600s, coming into Philadelphia in the southeastern part of the state, and then spreading fairly rapidly up in through the early to mid 1700s. And by 1770, you can see that most of the southeast has been settled. And then we start to move out toward what we call the Western Front, which was really where the Ohio border is now, and up into the North Central and the Northeast. But we also need to consider what was happening at this time in our state's history and really our nation's history. Pennsylvania goes from a colony to one of the first states in a brand new nation. And as it is called the Keystone State, it's a keystone in providing a lot of the resources that were needed for this new nation, particularly lumber. And then as we moved in to the future generations, coal and a variety of other resources. And then as we look at the early 1800s to mid 1800s, we can see that almost all of the state has all of a sudden been settled, except for a few places in the north central and the northwestern part. This was really our last bastion of wilderness area. But then, of course, it didn't take long before that all disappeared by the early 1900s. And really, how were we able to do this? It really comes down to this new technology at this time of steam power. And so all of a sudden, we are removing trees much faster than they can regrow. And we're running our narrow gauge railroads and railways up into the mountains up into these small valleys in between the ridges, and we're bringing trees out at an alarming rate. By the early 1900s, this is what most of Pennsylvania looks like. Really, it's a moonscape across the state, and we've lost one of our greatest resources. But it wasn't just trees that we lost. We actually lost a fair amount of wildlife during this time and then following this time. So by the late 1860s, by 1870, the beaver, the elk have disappeared. By 1900, the mountain lion, the gray wolf, and the American martin are gone. By the 1920s, the fisher disappears. And then as Pennsylvania transitions from a forested state to an agricultural state, we start to see some other issues kind of crop up as we move into the 1950s and the 1960s, and that's primarily to do with pesticides. And so all of a sudden, we start to see peregrine falcons and osprey disappear. By 1983, we had three bald eagle nests left within the state. And as development starts to increase and agriculture starts to get edged out and the farmers are trying to use uh, trying to produce more with less acreage. We see clean farming come in the 1970s and 1980s, and all of a sudden what habitat was there for wildlife begins to disappear even more. 
And then, of course, by the late 1990s, the bobwhite quail disappears. And it's not just these species that completely disappeared. We also almost lost things like white-tailed deer and turkeys and river otter and, of course, the bald eagle. But the one thing with Pennsylvania is we do have a fairly redemptive story. And part of that is because Pennsylvania does one thing extremely well. It grows trees. And trees began to grow back. The forest began to come back. But we also had a lot of help that we provided through organizations like the CCC and others planting tens, if not hundreds of thousands of trees throughout the state. But we also had some other issues. By this time, we had lost many species, and those species aren't going to just come back on their own. And we also had another issue. It was called market hunting. And so many of our wildlife resources are being removed in mass from the landscape and being sent to the major cities like Philadelphia and New York, Baltimore, to help feed the folks in those cities. But our rural folks here in Pennsylvania were really struggling because that's where they got their food as well. And so Pennsylvanians began to cry out for a change, for regulation. And by 1895, the legislature heard those folks and created the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And our real role was to really stop market hunting first and foremost, and then move into further wildlife management as we moved into the future. At the same time, we started to see the Pennsylvania Forestry Commission coming on board. And the Pennsylvania Forestry Commission is important because this was really our primarily our foresters, and they're buying up a lot of this valueless timber land for pennies on the dollar because it really was valueless to the lumber companies. They'd have to wait another hundred years before they could turn another profit. At this, and then as we move into the early 1900s, we start to see the U.S. Forest Service come in and develop a large piece of ground that we now know as the Allegheny National Forest. And just with these three agencies alone, in Pennsylvania, we have over four and a half million public land acres that belongs to Pennsylvanians and belongs to their children and their grandchildren in perpetuity. And this is very important as we start to talk about wildlife and wildlife restoration into the future. So we're going to revisit this here in a bit. And so we begin this legacy of restoration within our state. And we really actually start it fairly soon after we lose a lot of our acreages with forests. And so as early as 1913 to 1916, we begin bringing white-tailed deer in from a variety of different states, and we begin to stock them throughout Pennsylvania. Now, if you're familiar with Pennsylvania, if you've ever even driven through Pennsylvania, you know that we have lots of deer here now. There's deer everywhere. They stand along every major highway, the turnpike. Uh, they're all over the road, unfortunately. And so we went from almost nothing to having deer, and really in many areas, too many deer within the state. At the same time, we took advantage of an overwhelming elk herd in Yellowstone. And we began to bring elk in from Wyoming, some from Montana, and we brought them across the country on rail cars, and we took them out in wagons and sleighs into the state, particularly the northern tier, the northwest and north central regions, and we put them into the woods, and they have done extremely well. We now have a very healthy elk herd in Pennsylvania, and we have many folks that come to see our elk, to hear our elk each year. In the early 1920s, we began beaver restoration. We brought beaver in from Canada, and we brought beaver in from several uh, upper Midwestern states, and it was the perfect time to bring this species back because we had so much early successional growth along our waterways, along our rivers and streams, our ponds, lakes, and marshes, and beaver took off. We have beaver throughout the state of Pennsylvania, primarily up in the northern tier, but we also have beaver down in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, and we see beaver doing extremely well now within the state, and we manage those through trapping and harvest. 
and then wild turkeys. We actually failed a few times when we tried to bring turkey back to Pennsylvania. We thought we could raise turkey on farms, and so we attempted to release turkey. We released tens of thousands of domestic turkeys throughout the state, raised on farms, and were not successful. But what we found was that if you trap wild turkeys and move them, they would actually do very well where you put them. And we began to do that in Pennsylvania and became so successful that Pennsylvania became one of the major sources for the eastern wild turkey throughout much of the eastern side of the, of the nation, even into the Midwest. And so we provided a lot of turkeys for other restoration projects throughout uh, the eastern side of the U.S. And then, as I mentioned, in 1983, we had three bald eagle nests left in the state. So we began to take action fairly quickly. We actually brought eaglets in from Canada, and we built what is called a hacking tower. And then we would raise these eaglets without human contact until they were old enough to fledge. And then when they left and then eventually became adults, they would come back because they had imprinted on these areas and nest. And we saw eagles make an absolute about face. And then we've seen eagles come back to the point where we delisted eagles several years ago. And we have eagles throughout the state. This is an important one to me because I have a 13-year-old daughter. And when she sees an eagle, there is no reaction. It's like seeing a robin or any other bird that is out there and common. But for me, I just about wreck the truck every time I see an eagle because to me, I remember a time when we didn't have eagles on the landscape and now they're everywhere. And that's the same with ospreys. We have osprey on almost every major body of water. We have peregrine falcons in all of our major cities like Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Harrisburg. And then we have peregrines actually returning to many of their historic cliff nesting locations throughout the state as well. In the early 80s, we also began otter reintroduction. So we brought otter in from several different states. Now, we had never lost otter up in the Pocono region, but we didn't have many left. So we brought them in. We stocked them in seven different waterways throughout the state. And then what we've seen has been really wonderful in watching the otter come back over the years. And now we have otter again throughout all of the state. Um, and we see otter uh, doing extremely well, even on some of the smaller bodies of water in places where we never would have expected to see otter. And they're continuing to increase. And then there's the fisher, another species that this one actually was extirpated. And then we decided to bring these back in the mid 1990s. And we stocked fisher from several different states across the northern tier. We also had fisher coming up from West Virginia from an earlier reintroduction effort in the 1970s that naturally expanded into the southwest corner of the state. And now we have fisher throughout the state continuing to expand their range as well. Now, I was very fortunate. Prior to this position, I was the quail and pheasant biologist. And I've spent the last eight years working on quail restoration. And just last week, we reintroduced the first wild bobwhite quail back into the state after many years. And so we are very excited to continue that project, and we'll be doing that over the next three years, bringing birds in from a variety of different states and then stocking them in appropriate habitat that we've been working on developing within Pennsylvania. But there's three species that we didn't mention that were on that original timeline and we'll see if you can remember what they are, because two of them would be extremely difficult to bring back. And one would be the gray wolf, one would be the mountain lion. And I'm not saying biologically they'd be difficult. We don't know. We, we'd likely have the prey availability. We'd likely have the habitat. But on the other side of that biological coin for wildlife management is the social side. And understanding, are Pennsylvanians ready to have two apex predators return to their state? Some are, and some aren't. But there's one species that we've largely forgotten over the past 120 years since it disappeared, and that's the American martin. It's a species that we've had multiple generations of Pennsylvanians come and go without ever knowing what the species was or having the opportunity to see one. 
So for us as an agency and as a state to really understand, is this something that we are interested in reintroducing? We really needed to develop what we call feasibility assessment. And there's different factors of a reintroduction feasibility assessment. The first of those is really historically, did we have Martin? Where were they at in the state if we did? And what does their basic ecology look like? What do they eat? What do they need for habitat? And then, of course, what does reproduction look like and a variety of other things? The second thing is, do we even have habitat left in the state? We know that most of their habitat was gone, and that's largely why we lost them. So when it came back, did it come back in a meaningful way? What are some of the potential impacts, not just to other species from Martin, but from other species like the Fisher to the Martin? Has this ever been done before? Have past reintroduction efforts ever occurred? Not in Pennsylvania necessarily, but in other states or provinces. And if they have, what can we learn from that? And then, why would we do this? What kind of justification do we have? And in my mind, this is one of the most important things we need to consider. So what we did is we started to look into some of the historical documents. We looked into early explorer journals, early settler journals. We looked uh, at different museums within the state to see what they had in their archives that could help us understand, was the Martin a common native species? And we found that indeed it was. In fact, most of Pennsylvania would have been covered in forest, and anywhere there was forest, we would have had Martin. And Martin actually were found the whole way down the Appalachian Ridge to northern Tennessee, and then the whole way back up. And so we would have had Martin throughout much of the state, but what we know is this is a very habitat-specific species, and when that habitat disappeared in the 1800s, we lost the Martin. And by the late 1800s, right before it all disappeared, you can see exactly where we had some of our last known locations. And if you remember our settlement pattern, this is some of those last wilderness areas before they were finally cut over by 1900. Now, because it's been gone for so long, Pennsylvanians, including myself, really didn't know anything about the Martin. And so one of the first things is just to get some of that basic biology. How big is it? Where does it fit in with some of the other mustelids or members of the weasel family? And we have all these other mustelids in the state, but what we found is the Martin's actually the same size as the mink, average about two pounds, and they measure between 19 to 24 inches. And here you can see a picture of a fisher on the left, and then we have a Martin next to it. We have a mink next to that, and then we have a fox squirrel. And this gives you a good size comparison between all these species. And then we look at diet. We're going to dive into diet a little deeper here, but just a real general outlook at diet, we see that the majority of the marten diet is made up of small mammals. And when we say that, we mean voles and shrews and mice, but it's also eats a lot of plant material and primarily seeds, soft mast and hard mast. And then it eats a lot of insects, an incredible amount of insects. But it also eats birds and squirrels, eats hare and rabbits. In this other category, we see things like fish and amphibians and reptiles and carrion. And then when we talk about Martin habitat, the best thing I can do is to show you a picture and describe it as what we call structural complexity. And it really just means there's a lot going on in this forest. It's a forest with down woody debris. It's a forest with root balls and rock piles, an understory, a midstory, and an overstory. And within that overstory, standing dead and standing live trees with lots and lots of cavities. This is really important for Martin biology, but this is really important for any other species that we have that are forest species within the state. And this is what we generally try to do to manage our forests within Pennsylvania. And then how do we answer this question of having suitable habitat? The first thing we did was build a model. So we take a variety of different layers, most of these based on satellite imagery, and we figure out for each layer, what does a Martin exactly need? And then we stack those layers on top of each other and this is what we come out with. It come out with a very clear map. And what it's showing us is in dark green, we have 
very highly suitable habitat. And as that color gets lighter into that beige color, it's very poor habitat. Now, why would we build a habitat model, not just for Pennsylvania, but for the Northeast and for Michigan? Well, we have no way of truthing a model if we don't have Martin. So we build it for states that are closest to us that actually have Martin. And when we look at these Martin populations, looking at this dark green color, and then overlaying where we have existing populations of Martin, it overlays very nicely, which gives us good confidence that we have a good model. And when we look at Pennsylvania specifically, we see that most of that habitat is still found in that north central to northwestern region. Now, we do have some on our ridge tops and our ridge and valley region along our Allegheny front. But what's important, as we mentioned before, is public land. When we look at just public land in Pennsylvania, we see that the majority is still up in that north central northwestern part of the state. And public land is important because the forests in these areas have long term management plans, plans that span over 100 years in length, because that's what we have to do to manage for trees. And the good thing is if commodity prices come up and there's a real rush on timber, these areas won't see the removal of a lot of acreage in timber because they are part of a long-term plan such as we would see with private lands within the state. We also brought experts in from a variety of different states that have Martin to tell us really with boots on the ground, does this look like Martin habitat? And indeed, they, they confirmed that it did. And in some cases, they said we had better Martin habitat than some of the places where they had Martin in their own states. Now, this is where a lot of Pennsylvanians may be concerned is what are the impacts that Martin might have on other species? And we think of other species that might share that same habitat. We're thinking of things like wood rat and hares, northern flying squirrels and grouse, northern goshawk, and even the wild turkey. These are all species that people care deeply about. And many of these species are species that are not really doing well in Pennsylvania. So the first thing that we want to look at is, well, where do these species really fall out in the Martin diet? So we looked at 13 different diet studies for Martin across their range, much of which overlaps with these species. The first thing that we see is Without even reading the names of these species, we see just this overall huge breadth of diet items, and some of these are grouped. And that's important to understand. This is a true omnivore and a facultative generalist. But then the next thing to look at is what really makes up the large majority. And what we see, again, is these voles and mice and shrews. At number four, we see insects. And then where do these other species fall out? We see the snowshoe hare falling out in the middle. As we go further down towards the bottom, we see the rough grouse. We see a bushy-tailed wood rat, which is a good stand-in for our Allegheny wood rat. And then we see the flying squirrels at the bottom. Now, there's two species we don't see on here that were on that original slide previously. One is the northern goshawk. And we looked into the literature. We found that these two are fairly evenly matched. We had one case where a marten killed a goshawk and two cases where a goshawk killed a marten. So there's not a major concern there. We also have folks that are concerned about turkeys, and we found no evidence of turkeys, whether that was an adult, a poult, or an egg being eaten by martens. So we talked to turkey biologists in these other states where they have marten. We looked in the literature, and there's really not much out there, which gives us the idea that there's really not much of a concern for turkeys, even though a marten may occasionally eat something like a poult or an egg but we really didn't find many eggs in the diet. And this diet really did look at all four seasons, including the summertime. And we found with eggs, it's an extremely low percentage, even low enough to not even make this chart. One thing we did see, which is very interesting, is that marten eat other marten. And we did a diet study on fisher in Pennsylvania, only to find that female fisher within our state actually eat a very high percentage of other fisher. And we don't really know why that's the case, but we do see that with Martin as well at a much lower percentage. But there's also this idea that there could be negative impacts from other species to the Martin, such as the fisher, such as the bobcat, the coyote, even impacts from smaller species that are competing for the same food resource, such as our true weasels. 
And we looked at other states to try to understand, do these species coexist? And indeed they do, but how do they do it? So we began to really tease out the three primary ways that they're able to do this. One is through prey abundance. And we looked at prey abundance, especially for small mammals or voles and mice and shrews in Pennsylvania over the last 40 years. And in those last 40 years, we've had the reintroduction of the fisher. So we're able to see with an additional predator, is there an impact? And what we found is that, no, we actually have very high uh, prey abundance with this particular group throughout the state. And that hasn't changed over time. The second way is through the snow or what we call the subnivian layer, because Martin actually spent a lot of time under that snow layer during the winter. When we look at snowfall in Pennsylvania, we see that the largest majority is up in the north central and northwestern regions. And that's really where most of our good habitat falls as well. And Martin are able to use the snow as insulation, to use the snow uh, to avoid their predators such as owls and hawks. But also that's really where most of their food is. So they're actually out, able to outcompete many other species by accessing this food underneath the snow. And finally, it's what we call microhabitat. And it's this idea that through topography, through elevation, we see habitat changes very quickly from the bottom of a ridge, the entire way to the very top, we'll see multiple habitat changes. And this helps these animals coexist as well. Now we might be able to have Martin now based on what we found so far, but could we have Martin in 100 years or 300 years or 500 years with this potential of a changing climate? And so we look at things like climate change models and how that may change over time. And it can be very confusing. There's a lot of different models out there. But the model that we settled on was one from the Nature Conservancy that was really specific to the Northeast here. And what this model is showing us in green and blue is that these areas are really resilient to any potential changes in the future. A lot of it has to do with that elevation and topography, has to do with where latitudinally it is within the state. And what we see is that we would not expect to see a lot of change in forest composition or coverage over time. Now, do we know, has this ever worked before? Has anyone ever tried it before? And what we found and in actuality, it's been done over 40 different times in North America. In fact, it's one of the most often reintroduced fur bearer species. And most of these efforts have been proven largely successful. When we look at where these efforts have been, we can see in all these little white dots. And in some of these places, it's kind of surprising as to where they've done and had success. When we look at South Dakota, we can see that Martin reintroduced to the Black Hills. And the Black Hills are really a mountain range in the middle of prairie and agriculture. We look at these islands off the coast of Alaska, off the coast of the Great Lakes, and we can see that Martin will continue to persist in some of these areas where it's good habitat, but there's not a lot of it. When we look at Pennsylvania and the amount of habitat we have and the contiguousness of it, that makes us feel very confident that we would be able to successfully reintroduce the Martin and have it persist into the long term. Now, one of the most important things in my mind was justification. And when we looked at justification, we actually found that there's quite a bit through a variety of different categories. The first of those is ecologically. We know that this was once a common native species, and we know it's an important part of our ecological community here within the state. And it's not just those nice words to say. We actually know based on literature, there's two very important roles that it plays. One is rodent population management, which is very critical for a healthy forest system. And because of how many rodents it eats, and that's the primary part of its diet, it can play a major impact in that. But it also, because it eats so many seeds, seed dispersal has been found to be another critical role of the American marten. And it's important for many of our tree and shrub species within the state because they have such a large home range, a home range of an average of three and a half miles square. This tiny little animal is eating seeds and moving them throughout the forest in long distance. Another justification category is really the political side. 
And I use this kind of cautiously because we see this idea of biological diversity sometimes used in the political spectrum and sometimes misused. But we see that biodiversity is very important within our state. It's within our strategic plan. It's within our sister agencies' strategic plans, within the Forest Service plan. And when we talk about biological diversity, when you see the language, it's primarily just grasping onto what we have, trying not to lose more than what we've already lost. We know worldwide we lose between 200 to 2,000 species globally every year. And that's a travesty, but here's one of the few chances that we have in Pennsylvania to actually increase our overall biological diversity. Now, culturally, we know that this species was extremely important for many of the indigenous peoples, especially around the Great Lakes region. And in Pennsylvania, we don't have any tribal lands, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of indigenous peoples that still call Pennsylvania home. And it's important as a clan animal, it's important within many of the stories and many of their legends. And that's important to recognize as one of the justifications for this project. Economically, it can be very difficult to put a dollar amount on Martin reintroduction or any species reintroduction. But what we see, especially with some of our other species like the elk, is that we have over half a million people coming into the Elk Visitor Center from out of state, from in state, to see our elk, to pour money into that economy. For bald eagles and peregrine falcons, we have folks that travel the state to get the chance to see or to photograph these species. And these are just non-consumptive examples. On the consumptive side, in Pennsylvania alone, we have over 850,000 hunters pursuing white-tailed deer and turkey and many of the other game species we've reintroduced, like fisher and otter, and they're pouring millions upon millions of dollars, not only into the economy, but most of that money comes back to help with wildlife management, not just for game, but for many non-game species as well. Now, we mentioned the social side of things and how important that is for wildlife management. So we've actually conducted four different public opinion surveys. Three of these were general public opinion surveys. And what we found with our general surveys that of the Pennsylvanians that replied to these surveys, 92%, between 91 and 92% supported Martin reintroduction. And then between 85 to 92% of those that said they were a hunter also supported. But we wanted to look specifically just at hunters. Hunters do foot the bill for a lot of the wildlife management in Pennsylvania. And even though they only make up about 6% of Pennsylvanians, they are still an important constituent. So we looked at hunters specifically, and we found that 37% of hunters support it, 32% oppose it, and 31% really don't care whether it happens or not. So we have close to 70% that either support or don't care. Now, can you imagine if we ask this question about mountain lions or gray wolves? I have a feeling it might look a little bit different. And lastly, it's really, again, this legacy. Over the past 100 years, Pennsylvanians have helped lead the way in this nation in returning species back to their state. And it's not just one generation. It's been multiple generations. My grandparents' generation are the ones that brought back the deer and the elk and the turkey. My parents brought back the eagle and the otter. And now it's our turn to bring back the bobwhite. And here's another great opportunity for another species to bring back for the next generation, for my daughter. So to talk you through very quickly what this process looks like, it's actually been a three-year process and we still haven't made a decision on whether we're going to do this or not. Now that might seem a little extreme, and as the guy that's been leading it for three years, it's been a little bit tiring, to be honest, but it's no less important because we don't take these decisions lightly and we shouldn't. It's a wildlife resource. And so we started with our strategic plan to identify that we needed a feasibility assessment. So we worked on developing that. Then we developed a reintroduction and management plan, a long-term 10-year plan to move this forward if it gets approved. 
then we put that plan out for public review and comment because in Pennsylvania and many other states, wildlife belongs to Pennsylvanians. It belongs to the people. And they need to have a say in these major decisions that we make. And then we took those comments, we made changes, and then developed a final plan and brought this to our board of commissioners in January to ask them to accept the plan, which would give us the green light to reintroduce the species. Now, as with all politics, it actually got tabled at that meeting. And the board hesitated and wanted us to come back and look at a few additional items, which is very fair. We need to make sure that not just our Pennsylvanians comfortable with this, but the board who is responsible for making these decisions is comfortable with this as well. And so we're currently working on that and we're bringing this back up at our April commission meeting here within another month. And we're hoping that they will vote on it at that time. Now I do wanna go through some of the primary goals of the reintroduction plan very quickly. This is really a whole nother webinar if we wanted to do it at some point, but really cooperative partnerships that's with folks um, uh, uh, that own the land where we would put Martin. That's with other states and provinces where we would get Martin from. And then we have translocation and release. So how do we capture these animals? How do we move them across state lines, maybe even across international lines? Once we get them here, what do we do with them? How do we prepare them to be released? And then research and monitoring. So many past reintroduction efforts back in the 40s and 50s we saw animals just being moved, thrown out of, of boxes, and then you know wished well. And then we never followed up to see if they were successful or if they failed or why. And so it's important to get as much information as we can from this research. And then I and E, so getting out in front of the public, developing webinars and videos and pamphlets, trying to reach every Pennsylvanian to make them well more informed so that they can help us make a good decision. And finally, population management. If they become established, how do we then manage them into the future? Now, the last thing I like to do is just let folks know that this was not just a Pennsylvania initiative. What we did here is we developed working groups and steering committees, many of which had folks from out of state, out of state experts. And we worked with all of these groups. We worked with over 75 different groups across the nation to really ensure that these documents were solid and got review and got feedback to really feel like we did our due diligence. So with that, that's where it stands right now. And here's my contact information. You're welcome to contact me anytime. It's my cell phone number, you can call me. And then here's a QR code, and this will take you to our story map where you can find a lot more information. It's very interactive. And, uh, and you can also follow up on some of the things we talked about today, but I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. And if we don't get any questions, I also have some frequently asked questions that we can go over as well. That's great, Tom. Thanks so much. Right. What a, what a huge honor. Like you say, I really appreciate, you know, that each generation we're standing on the shoulders of the generation that went before us and kind of how do we continue to, to carry that work forward and learn from, learn from what they've done and, and I appreciate one of my questions was about the um, piece of the, the coordination, because clearly you led the effort with a really diverse group. And so great, nice to have you doing that. A um, couple questions. Um, one is, did you consider disease? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. And we did. So if you look in our plan, what we did is we really started to look in the, in the assessment. But what we did is we looked at Martin populations, particularly those that we would be interested in pulling source individuals from to really understand, are we going to be potentially bringing in a disease into Pennsylvania that could not only impact Martin, but other species that is that we don't currently have within the state. And so what we found is that there really isn't many. The only disease we found was out in the West that Martin will carry, occasionally carry plague. But those aren't Martin that we're really interested in pulling from. We're interested in trying to pull from sources that are very close to Pennsylvania, so to our north, even into the upper Midwest, uh, but not necessarily the, the west. And some of those are actually uh, considered um, a different species of martin as well. And we're really looking for the American martin. That's great. And, and another question about kind of as you were thinking it through, 
um, when you talked about negative impacts from other species to the Barton, uh, you didn't necessarily mention bear or raccoon, but did you consider mm -hmm. those? Yeah, so those, they're, they're certainly a good one to consider. We we hadn't seen anything in the literature where those two had impacted the Martin. We kind of focused on the ones that we knew had potential impacts based on literature, based on research, um, because in some states, these species don't coexist very well. And so, and generally because of the Martin size, it will lose out every time. Um, and that's where we are most interested in finding out what are those Kind of critical factors that allow the martin to coexist with these other species and we would assume that the same factors like habitat prey abundance uh, and snowfall would also all help uh, with other species like the bear and like the raccoon you know the raccoon would be specifically uh, it would be competing with the martin uh, not necessarily predating on the martin but the bear could potentially uh, be a cause of mortality. So, but do do we have the habitat? Do we have some of these other things that would kind of help mitigate those things? And I feel like we do, especially if it's going to mitigate against things like fisher, which are much more of a competitor, and bobcats and coyotes. That's that's great. Yeah, um, clearly, clearly such a such a well, well, you, you don't introduce a species lightly, both for the kind of impacts and the long term pieces. So one of the things um, looking forward, so first of all, is thinking, if you know when the date of the April meeting is, we'll be sure to update our attendees on kind of what happened. Yeah. Um, and then once, if it is approved, what's the timeline like? Mm. And when, when, when might you anticipate a first reintroduction happens? And what's the, is there already a budget approved for that? Or how does that whole process play out? Yeah. Yeah, all great questions. So the meeting date's April 13th. And so you can kind of check back in with us. We'll probably put a press release after that if it, if it does get brought up for, for a vote. Um, but yeah, as far as the budget goes, that's also something that we lay out within the management plan. And, and so overall budget's a little bit over $2 million for a 10-year uh, plan or 10-year project. In reality, this is an indefinite project, you know, if we have success. But really what that looks like is that first year, as far as our timeline goes, is really just trying to get coordination uh, between other states and provinces. So right now we have Ontario, New York, Michigan, and uh, Maine that have all uh, said that they would help to support uh, the project. And so we begin working with them in other states and provinces uh, on potentially how do we uh, trap these animals, how do we get these individuals to Pennsylvania? Um, and that really may require, and, and what I have in the plan is require hiring individuals to work out of those states, or hiring trappers, um, and, and that will all take time. So really the first year is just setting up all of the, the parts and pieces before we start to crank that wheel over. So then the, the following year, so this is a plan for 24, to start in 24, so 2025, we would begin to then start moving Martin. So start reintroducing these individuals. We have five different relo uh, reintroduction sites selected. And for each site, we need about 60 Martin total. And so we would look to pull 60 Martin per year per site over a five-year period. So then that would take care of really the first six years. And then following that, we have monitoring uh, protocols set up for for after that. But a lot of research and monitoring will start really day one as soon as those Martin hit the ground. And we have several grad students budgeted into this um, to make sure that that, that is you know, being um, addressed and, and we're trying to gather as much information as we can. So if you want to see a more detailed budget, uh, you can check out the management plan and you can find that here with this QR code. Um, and, and we have that in the appendix. Uh, where we have everything laid out and you can see exactly what that cost is associated with. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great to check out. Do you have a season um, that you introduce them when mm. you when you do that? That's a good question. And when we looked at literature to try to find out what is the best time of the year, really most reintroductions have always occurred during the winter time, but that's primarily because that's when Martin trapping season is. And it's usually when it's the easiest time to capture Martin. So that's when food resources are the lowest 
and that's generally when it's the easiest to get a marten into a trap uh, looking for food. And so that is likely the same uh, plan that we would follow suit with. And the other states and provinces have been very successful working with trappers. And really, trappers are how we were able to, you know, move otter and fisher and beaver. Uh, they're just an awesome resource because they're experts in their field at, at capture and then helping us move these animals. So it likely be, would begin in the wintertime during really open trapping seasons um, in these other states and provinces. Yeah, that 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 makes sense. I hadn't I hadn't quite thought that through, but that makes total sense. Um, and when you're working with other other agencies in other states, what are the what are the agencies that you're working with? Yeah, so that's a good question too. So I mentioned kind of the four primary founding uh, population agencies that have um, uh, basically formally decided that they would help support this, and whether that means providing Martin or in other ways, uh, we have Maine, Michigan, Ontario, and New York, and we're in talks with many other states and provinces as well. Um, but we're also looking at other organizations and agencies within the state. So, you know, we know one of our release locations would be on the Allegheny National Forest. So we have to work with the U.S. Forest Service. We know several of these other ones. In Pennsylvania, our game commission is separated from the large land management agency that manages our forest, which is the DCNR, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. So we've had to work with DCNR and make sure that they're on board. And we have, we have letters of support from all these other organizations and agencies. And right now we have about 24 different organizations, NGOs, agencies that are willing uh, to help us. And whether that's to be a founding population, to be a release site, or just to help in any other way possible, whether that's through funding um, or manpower or, or what have you. And we have really, really good support both in and out of the state. That's, that's really exciting. And it's also so, it's it's so important and hard to kind of break through and work with all of those different agencies, right? With all of the different the different timelines that, that they all operate on and those kinds of things. And so I applaud yeah. the... And, and understand the, the challenge of that. A um, couple of different thoughts. Um, Marie says that the QR code takes her to an email, not a website. Oh, crap. Okay. <laughs> Hold on, Marie. Thank you. This is an old, <laughs> let me, <laughs> which if you want to say, yeah, hold on. Let me, let me bring up the correct QR code. Okay, cool. My apologies. Yep. No, good, good to have it pointed out, right? Yes. I yes. Think, I think we will be going. <laughs> and then uh, Bob dropped in. Is it the story map, the American Martin page game? Bob just dropped it in the chat. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll bring it up here as well if you need it. Can Can okay. you see that? Uh, not yet. I think you're just sharing your. Oh, crap. Okay. Hold on here. Yeah. Let, so maybe you can unshare and then reshare. And try to do a new share here. Yeah. Good. And then also, what, as you're doing that, awesome, great. And then as you're doing that, I'll also um, share the um, some some praise from the from the chat. People, excellent presentation, well organized, clearly spoken. Thanks, super informative. So those kinds of things are popping awesome. up in the chat. So I want to appreciate Thank you, folks. that. Yeah. yeah, appreciate it. And then um, as we close, one of the thoughts I have is for you to share what's one or two of the the kind of frequently asked questions that you get that might be kind of a surprising one or something that yeah yeah well i can share with you like the frequently asked questions are generally questions of concern mm -hmm. and so so one that you might find interesting is the concern for chickens and so in pennsylvania and probably across our nation we probably have more chickens in in the country now than we probably have had since like the 1960s most chickens are not on chicken farms most are in our backyards. And so we have a lot of concern that this is another predator that's going to prey on our chickens. And so we try to address that in two different ways. The first is when we talk about where our habitat is, it's really, you know, this is a, a more of a wilderness type species, does not do well with human development, particularly suburban urban development. Um, and so the chances of a Martin actually interfacing with chickens is, is relatively low. Not to say we don't have chickens up in some of our 
uh, big pieces of unbroken uh, woodlands. But um, in those areas or really anywhere, you know, it comes down to responsible chicken management. So we always encourage people, you know, if, if your chicken's protected against weasels or mink, uh, raccoons, it's going to be protected against a marten. Um, and so that's one of the frequently asked questions. And I would say, you know, an, another one, and, and we try to cover all these questions within the presentation, um, is, is really, you know, isn't bringing another predator species back going to further um, increase the reduction in some of our other species that we're seeing losses in. And that's really where it's so important to look at diet and look at, you know, these other species we're concerned about, whatever that species is that you love the most and you're most concerned about, where does it fall out within that Martin diet? Um, and, and really it is an omnivore. So it's going to be selecting for the most uh, readily available species and not these species of concern that are really actually in low density across the landscape. Um, and then I always remind people to think about why are the species declining? You know, we often always point to predators first, but in reality, it's almost very rarely ever predators that are the primary driving factor. It's usually always habitat or disease. Uh, that seem to be, um, you know, depressing many of our, our populations. So, so those are kind of two of the most frequently asked questions that I get. Mm -hmm. those, those are good ones, right? And good to understand the, 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 the thoroughness with which, you know, you make the analysis of, of whether or not to undertake this. Yeah. So one final question, um, are there any healthy populations of mink in Pennsylvania? Mm. Didn't necessarily see that about the reintroduction, but you kind of mentioned that. Yeah, great question. And this is kind of another good thing to talk about because you know it is the same size as a mink. Now it has a very different habitat need um, and their food or their diet is a little bit different, but you know mink are much more associated with water and so they're going to see more uh, amphibians, reptiles, crustaceans, things like that within the diet of a mink and fish. Um, but yes, we have extremely healthy populations of mink in the state of Pennsylvania and, and really always have. And so when people are concerned about, you know, it, is the Martin going to now be under every log behind every rock? Um, and how is that going to impact the species we love? You know, we have these things in a different form all over Pennsylvania, and it's not eating everything. <laughs> so it's important to consider that as well. But yes, we do have very healthy mink populations within the state. That's great, Tom. Well, with just a couple of minutes till the top of the hour, I want to make sure that we let people go so that they can be on their way. But as we close, so thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you who are in attendance. Great to be back with you and appreciate the, the thoughtful questions that you asked. And again, encourage you all, these uh, are regular monthly webcasts, second Wednesday of each month. You can go to the website, uh, stewardshipnetwork.org slash webcast. Register for them. You can register early. We'll be sure to send you reminders for them. So we love seeing you. We love having the chance to be with you here. So thank you all. Next month, we will be with Jeff Masters um, talking about climate change, Michigan, and the bigger picture. Jeff is currently with Yale Climate Connections. Jeff also was the founder of Weather Underground, the very first online meteorological weather service. And so Jeff is uh, Jeff is steeped in this in this space. And so Really, he's a, he's a great presenter, fun to be with him. Um, remember, we've got the uh, Spring Challenge coming up. Stay tuned for information on that. And then uh, in May, we will be talking about mice, voles, beetles, and native, native plants, you know, a tour of the management at Nashua Grasslands, Illinois. So again, a long-term project that's been underway for a great time. And Catherine Hogan from Northern Illinois University will take us through that. Again, just a great chance to learn from somebody with incredible knowledge about it and an incredible restoration project. So again, thank you. Really appreciate your time. I look forward to seeing you again whenever we, whenever our paths cross and my door's open, Tom's door's open, and I don't think you can get any cuter than that little Martin. <laughs> it's hard to beat, that's for it sure. It is hard to beat, right? <laughs> great. So, and Lori, yes, a live recording will be available. Check back on our website. And so we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you all. Yep. Thanks, everybody.